Welcome to Hummingbirds of Kansas Advanced Training. My name is Lynn Wild, and I'm a K-State Extension uh, Wyandotte County Master Gardener and serve as Vice President Program Chair. It's my privilege to introduce Chuck Audie. He grew up on a farm in York County, Nebraska. He attended and received two degrees from the University of Nebraska in agronomy. He has been employed by the Geary County Extension Office since February 19th. Chuck has the sole programming responsibilities for agriculture, horticulture, and natural resources for Geary County, Kansas. Chuck has been the Geary County Extension agent for 39 years. He has served as president of the National Association of County Agricultural Agents in 2000, excuse me, in 2017. He has co-authored two books about Kansas birds, as well as several magazine articles about birds and birding. Uh, Chuck, go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Lynn. Hopefully everybody can hear me just fine this, this morning. Um, they're about 150 feet away from the corner of our office. They're taking down an old pine tree next to the courthouse for some needed construction, and it's getting a little bit noisy at times. I apologize if any of that interferes. So yeah, we're going to talk about hummingbirds this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share one of my passions, and that's birds in Kansas and birds in general. Um, we're about six weeks away from the start of hummer season, not too early to be thinking about things you can do to help attract birds to your, um, to your area. So, and I will just toss in what Lynn already said, please check and make sure that your mics are on mute. So let's get talking about hummingbirds. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, hummingbirds are absolutely amazing. This is not a Kansas hummingbird. I think it should be a K-State hummingbird with all those beautiful purple colors on it. But hummingbirds are, are a group of birds that are only found in the Western Hemisphere, North and South America. Um, they can be found from sea level clear up to 15,000 feet plus in the Andes, uh, sometimes in very limited and very specific ecosystems. Some of them have evolved and adapted to be the principal pollinator for certain unusual flowers and all. Uh, they seem to be finding one or two more new species every year, but currently there's between around 360 species of hummingbird between North and South America. So it's a very broad group and an absolutely fascinating group. No other group of birds has the abilities that hummingbirds do. Um, there's some that are similar, some, similar, similar nectar feeders like sunbirds that are found in Asia, Africa, Australia, but none have all the amazing flight abilities that the hummingbirds have. I, I'm a guy that likes to talk about philosophy every once in a while um, <laughs> for what it's worth. Uh, good selection and placement of plant materials will improve the attractiveness of your yard to hummingbirds and to other wildlife for that matter. But what I have found is that if you really want to bring in hummingbirds, especially if you're on a smaller urban lot, um, you need to have feeders often in the plural. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But landscaping helps. Hummingbird feeders is going to really bring them in virtually no matter where you live. So we need to stop for a minute and think about what do hummingbirds want or maybe more specifically, what do hummingbirds need? They need the same thing as, as all living creatures. They need water. In this case, most of the water they get, virtually all the water they get, is from the sugar water, the nectar that they drink. Uh, here's a nice little factoid that you can amaze your friends and family with. Uh, hummingbirds are one of the few species of birds that actually urinate. Uh, most birds are very water conservative, and they have one form of excrement, which we affectionately call whitewash. Uh, hummingbirds actually do urinate. So. That's the amazing fact you never wanted to know. Uh, hummingbirds need food, and it's not just sugar water. Sugar water is very important. That's their carbohydrate source. But like all mammalian species, they need protein. Just like you and me, we need protein in some form. For hummingbirds, it's not going to come from the sugar water or the nectar. It's going to come from small flying insects. We have records of hummingbirds every month of the year in Kansas. 
March, late February, March tends to be the hardest time for them to survive through. They can handle the cold weather as long as they have food. The thing that'll get them is lack of flying insects. Now, granted, yesterday there were flying insects uh, throughout most of Kansas, but all last week it was just too cold. So, you know, sometimes it's not just the sources of nectar that we put out there for the birds, but it's the other plants that we have, like red buds, that might have small insects on the undersides of the leaves that they can feed on when they're coming back through during the summertime. And the third thing everything needs is cover, shelter, protection. They need shelter from weather, from the predators. They need safe resting and roosting locations, nesting and brood rearing locations. Basically, and I've got several interesting slides about um, nesting of hummingbirds in Kansas. It's pretty much limited to the eastern third to half of the state. Basically, from about Salina on to the Missouri border is where we're going to find them nesting. The closer you get to Missouri, the further east in the state you get, the more common they are as a nesting species. Okay, in the eastern United States, from that Salina, the old Highway 81 corridor, um, from there to the east coast, most of what you're going to see are ruby-throated hummingbirds. Call it the hummingbird du jour. Um, but you always need to be on the lookout for that one in a thousand. We've got about 11 species of hummingbirds that we have seen in Kansas. Mexican violet ear, black chin, annas, calliope, broad-tailed, broad-billed, rivalies. That one keeps having its name changed. Costas, rufus, allens. And, and there's several others that we are on the lookout for because they've been found in, in neighboring states. Most of what you're going to have are ruby throats, but maybe that one Sunday morning in, in July, just as migration is getting started, something like this adult male rufous hummingbird could show up at your feeders. Um, I had been putting out hummingbird feeders for 30 years, and finally, the, the Sunday after the county fair got over, I was out back filling my feeder. I heard a different noise, went inside, and here this little rascal showed up. So stuck around for about a day, then moved on further south. But, you know, Rufus Hummingbird is one of the more likely Western migrants that we're gonna see in Eastern Kansas. Um, a lot of times I'll get people that'll call in and see if I can get my pointer here to work. They'll say, hey, I've got this Hummingbird that's got a little bit of Rufus on its side. Well, Ruby-throated Hummingbirds can have that too. If you really wanna know if you've got a Rufus Hummingbird, start looking at the tail. Do they have that Rufus, that reddish look? because a lot of these are gonna be immature or female birds coming through in, in July, August, early September. This is one two years ago that was added our feeder on the farm north of Junction City. Um, and I was able to get a good look at it and get some good pictures of its tail just to see that Rufus, uh, uh, Rufus blob there, you might say. Broad-tailed hummingbird. This is sort of the ruby-throated hummingbird equivalent for the Western United States. If you've ever been out in Colorado in the mountains during August, September, and hear this loud whirring sound, this high-pitched whistle, uh, that's the male broad-tailed hummingbird. They sort of fill the same ecological niche in the Western U.S. that ruby throats fill in the Eastern U.S. We get a lot of them that come through, especially in Western Kansas. Calliope hummingbird is a very small hummingbird, very distinctive hummingbird. Uh, that we can have records clear to, to the Kansas City area. Black chin hummingbird is one that if you see either a black chin hummingbird or an adult male ruby-throated hummingbird and they're not in the full sunlight, it can be hard to tell them apart, very hard, because here you can see that the color in their throat is called the gorget, and up here where it's not in the sunlight, it looks black, and the ruby throat will be the same way. So don't let a black throat fool you get it in the sunlight and see if that black chin, if that really purple chin starts to show up. And then of course, the ruby-throated hummingbird, the one that we're going to expect to see most of the time in Eastern Kansas. Okay, the hummingbird season. It's gonna start around the middle of April and there is a brief but furious spring migration that lasts from about mid-April to early May, mid-May. And a lot of these birds are heading north. They're going to be in Kansas for a day or two and move on. Right now, they are driven by one purpose, nesting. It's a, it's a strong driving force. And that's an important distinction between the spring migration and the southbound migration later on. Um, we will see a lot of hummingbirds come through. If we have a cold front come and some north winds for a couple of days, you may see a lot of hummingbirds at your feeders. And then the wind goes back to the south and poof, a lot of them are gone. Uh, sometimes I, I frequently tell people 
that if it gets to the first of June and you have not seen a hummingbird at your feeder for a couple of weeks, you probably don't have any nesting in your neighborhood. Take the feeder down, put it back up then in, in late summer. But about the third or fourth week of July, southbound migration starts with ruby throats. And I'll give you a heads up, the males are around for one purpose and one purpose only to make sure the female lays a fertile egg. They take no involvement in raising the young and feeding the young or anything. Um, so the adult males start heading south first. And then a few weeks later, the adult females. And the last ones to come through are the young of the year. And amazingly, they all wind up in the same locations to, to overwinter. So what we really want to do is emphasize plants are going to be in full bloom during August and early September, because that's when we're going to have the majority of our birds coming through the area. Yeah, I talked about that. Now, that same time frame is also when the other hummingbirds in the Western United States are starting to move south also. And at that time, we get a lot of post-breeding dispersal. As they move south, they get caught in some of the prevailing winds from the west, or they just want to take a trip. So that is the time that we're most likely going to see non-ruby-throated hummingbirds in eastern Kansas. If you're out in Garden City, Dodge City, Elkhart in extreme southwest Kansas, you can expect to see probably four or five hummingbird species every late summer. But um, around here, it's an exciting time when you get something other than a ruby-throated hummingbird. I, I never used to have these slides in here, but people were always asking me about nest building, about the birds in, in Kansas. So I put this in. Um, in Kansas, hummingbirds have been documented building nests from early June to early July. Eggs have been documented in these nests from about the middle of June to really the middle of August. And the nestlings have been, been observed from, from late June through late August. That's pretty much the breeding season. Generally, they only have one brood a year. Uh, if they start nesting and a big storm comes through, destroy the nest, they may try to, try to re-nest. But really, you've got to get, get down into the Gulf Coastal states before you get into double brooding. The nest side, the female takes full control of that. She determines where the nest is going to be. She builds the nest. One of the things I want to emphasize is these are tiny little birds. Their length is 3.4 inches long on average. So they're just going to be, you know, wide as long as my hand is wide. Got a wingspan of four and a half inches. Here's the thing to me that is really amazing. They weigh one tenth of an ounce, three grams. They're a little bit heavier than a penny, a little bit lighter than a nickel. Put a penny in your hand and that's what it feels like. Lifespan, the record is 12 years, and that was from a female ruby throat that was banded and then was recaptured on numerous occasions. On average, they're going to live three to five years in the wild. Their memory, they have excellent memory. When I lived in town for 33 years, there was a spot on the fence where I would hang a hummingbird feeder every year. And one year, it was past the middle of April, and I didn't have the hummingbird feeder up yet. I looked outside and right where the hummingbird feeder usually hangs was a hummingbird just kind of going around looking for it. So I scattered around and found a hummingbird feeder and got it filled and got it out. But they will remember from last fall where the hummingbird feeders were. So I always encourage people to, you know, get them out by the middle of April. Sometimes they'll hit Southern Kansas as early as the 10th of April. But just if you had feeders last year and you had hummingbirds, they will remember that. Okay, back to the nesting. And I wanted to talk about the weight of these things a little bit because of a slide here coming up. They like to be out near the tip of a downsloping branch. They want fairly open area underneath and of course canopy or protection above. If you watch them come into your feeders, they usually come in from below and then fly up and perch and land. That, that's their normal technique. They want to do the same thing with the nest. Whole variety of, of different species, oak, hornbeam, birch, populous species, which would include cottonwoods, hackberry, pine. In general, they prefer deciduous over coniferous trees. Nests have been documented from one and a half to 50 feet up. Generally, 16 to 23 feet is what most of them kind of come in at. Nesting location is generally determined by availability of food, nearby nectar, nearby insects. This is out of uh, a 
big, thick volume that uh, Dr. Bent did back in the 40s about how they build the nest. And I just want to put this in there. I mean, they use primarily spider web and then lichens or bud scales, things like that to kind of camouflage it. And they start by laying down this figure eight of, of spider web and they start building it up. And what cracks me up is how it was referred to here as the, um, oh, no, I just lost it, where they stamp down the base with their feet. You're talking about a bird that weighs as much as a penny stamping their feet. To me, that just, I find absolutely hilarious. But that's how, that's how she builds a nest. The nests are small. Think of a quarter. I should have had one out of my pocket here. The inside of that nest is going to be just about as big around as a quarter is, and it's going to be about as deep as a quarter is wide. So it is a very small nest. That is what a hummingbird nest looks like. That was um, a friend of mine that lives up in Clay Center. I, I will admit, I've been spending my entire life, I've been a bird watcher since I was four. I've been looking for to find a hummingbird nest. I know they nest at my farm. I have not found one yet. My friend Karen up in Clay Center, um, one spring sent me a picture of this hummingbird and two days later, she sent me a picture of another hummingbird, two hummingbirds nesting in her, in her yard and I've yet to find one. One of the questions I am frequently asked is, do hummingbirds reuse the nest from one year to the next? Generally, no. And the reason is, this was the other nest in Karen's yard about the time the young were ready to fledge. The nest has been trashed by the teenagers. There's, there's virtually nothing left there. So uh, sometimes you'll find them in pretty good shape. I often think that if they are still in pretty good shape, probably because the nest failed in some respect or another. But the likelihood of them reusing the nest is very, very slim. Now let's get into the fun part. How do I make my yard more attractive to hummingbirds? Well, we already talked about the feeders, and we'll talk a little bit more about feeders after the plants. But I put together a selection of lists based on my experience, based on friends' experiences, based on a lot of different things. But plants that do a pretty good job of attracting hummingbirds. Hummingbirds will feed on more than just red flowers, by the way. Quality and quantity of nectar is important. They won't feed on daylilies because daylilies, for the most part, have no nectar. Um, but red is the flashing neon light. It's the thing that says, hey, hummingbirds, here we are. Come and see us. Once they are there, they'll start visiting every single flower they can find. Um, a fun thing to do is if you have a lot of activity at your hummingbird feeder, put a lawn chair out four or five feet away from your feeder and put on a red shirt or a red cap and then just sit quietly and see how long it is before they come and check you out. Hummingbirds have no fear. I mean, they are just audacious at times um, and they will check you out they will come I mean, some people want to see hummingbirds you know land on a feeder that they're holding i've had that happen not intentionally but it's it's really fun to do that my number one favorite plant is salvia you know it could be the good old-fashioned old, traditional red salvia it could be one of the newer cultivars like the lady in red salvia um, one of the things that, that we're starting to do because friends of mine in Garden City do is they plant up a lot of pots. Now, my friends in Garden City plant about 30 pots full of different salvias every year. The reason they do this in pots is we always seem to have that cold snap sometime in late September or October where it gets down to frosty weather for a night or two, and then it warms back up for another three to four weeks. When they see that cold weather coming, before it gets down to freezing, they move all those pots of salvia into their garage. Car sits outside. Um, and then once it warms back up, they move those salvia back outside. So if it was a killing frost, they've still got salvia blooming for another month. And that's the way they keep attracting more birds to their feeders. So salvias are readily available. I've got my salvia started. I planted them in the flats and they're in the light frame right now. Uh, last weekend, um, I got about a flat and a half of them started. I'm going to be ready for them this year. Agastaki, Agastache, I've heard it called a lot of things. I've seen it called hummingbird mint. Um, and I've seen annuals and perennial versions of this. Uh, it, this is one that in drier climates seems to be really, really good. And it's becoming more and more available in the trade. Uh, if you've got a big flower bed, plant a couple clumps of this. and Just see how the, how the hummingbirds react to it. I'm going to take a little bit of time now talking about trumpet creeper or trumpet vine. This is not a plant 
to put into small yards. When I lived in town, I had a 5,000 square foot lot. Moved in in, the, in December of 1986. In the spring of 1987, I planted one trumpet vine in the back corner of the lot. In the spring of 1988, I started trying to kill that trumpet vine. And when we moved out of there two years ago, I was still trying to kill that trumpet vine. They, are, they can be very aggressive. They are native. It is a native plant, but you want to plant it where you have a lot of space. This photo here on the lower right, that's friends of mine out in the country. And believe it or not, there is a wooden fence underneath that. And about every five years, they'd cut it down to the ground. And within two years, it'd be growing back up and over it. You can see the, the, the flowers here and the deep, deep trumpet shape of them. Uh, Orioles will love these too. I've seen brown thrashers and mockingbirds and catbirds get into these. The tall picture here on the left, that is out at my farm. Underneath that is a old windmill tower. So that's 20, 25 feet in the air. You can see how I kind of have to keep it trimmed at the bottom so I can mow around it. Um, this is Hummingbird Central in August and, and early September. There are hummingbirds flying all over that. They're feeding on it. They're landing on those branches that come out to the ends. I'm pretty sure they are nesting in it somewhere. I just haven't figured out how to get in there and look for that nest. But trumpet vine, I used to say, I used to question how much it attracted hummingbirds until I saw a big wild patch of it, probably 75 feet around one August, and it was just loaded with hummingbirds. I planted this, my, my in-laws lived at this farm, and, and I planted this there probably 25 years ago. You can see how it's taken over. Um, and it will attract hummingbirds. There's absolutely no question about that. Scarlet runner bean is an heirloom bean variety. Allows you to garden on the, let's see, is that vertical or horizontal? Anyway, allows you to garden up and down. Um, it's a pole type bean. Red flowers are very attractive. The beans are edible. Uh, if you ever buy a package of hummingbird seed mix, flowers for hummingbirds, there will probably be at least two or three scarlet runner bean seeds in there. You can buy them just as a, as a cultivar, especially from somewhere that specializes in heirloom bean varieties. Cardinal climber is one that I became familiar with uh, in my bird watching trips out to Elkhart, down on the Oklahoma border, almost to Colorado. Um, it kind of, it's a vining plant. Um, it kind of has almost a bindweed flower, then I say that very you know, nervously, uh, but it is an annual. It's very frost sensitive. But out there, people would would put a, a like a pipe in the ground, six to eight feet tall, and put string coming down, sort of like a Native American teepee, and then plant cardinal climber at the base of these. And by the middle of September, this was just this, this pyramid of blooming flowers that the hummingbirds just loved. Friends in Southeast Kansas say that it has volunteered for them at times and has been a little bit of an issue. I would proceed with caution on this. I, I don't know where it is native to. Um, but it, it will attract hummingbirds, I guarantee that. Cardinal flower is a very good native flower, likes wet areas. There's a small stream just outside of, of Junction City on a dead end road um, that has a patch of cardinal flower there. And every year there are hummingbirds there all through the summer. And I just love to sit on the old bridge and, and watch them come and go to it. it it's going to do, do well in a place if, you ha if it soil tends to stay damp. It's a real good wetland plant. Bee balm is an old variety. Um, I've seen it mentioned in quite a few um, articles about landscaping for hummingbirds. I have not grown it. I don't know how well it actually does in Kansas as far as attracting hummingbirds, but I include it in here for the simple point that I want you to remember that whatever you plant for hummingbirds as a flowering plant is going to attract other pollinators including bees. And if you happen to be allergic to bee stings, and I have friends that are very allergic to bee stings, proceed with caution. You may want to get these things a little bit further away from your house. Butterfly bush, um, this is my butterfly bush. I see hummingbirds checking it out occasionally, but I think I've got a lot of other things they prefer more. But boy, do the butterflies like it. You know, if you've got a good sunny hot location in your yard, good thing to put there for, for a lot of the pollinators, not just butterflies. Hollyhocks used to be at every old farmstead throughout the country. You know, you'd go out there, they'd be by the side of the garage, by the side of the, of the chicken house, wherever. Uh, then they sort of fell out of favor and now they're coming back in. This is another good hummingbird plant. 
Um, I've started planning it, you know, in some sunny locations around some of the, the buildings out of the farm now, uh, trying to get it well established. Once you get it going good, it's going to keep going for quite a while. Similar looking flower, Rose of Sharon. This is a, a shrub plant. Um, this is a plant that's really good for screening. It can, can grow fairly upright. Uh, you can plant them fairly close together. Good to block the view of that neighbor that you maybe don't want to have to see on a regular basis, but you can plant it. It grows well, very, very florifera, floriferous, um, and hummingbirds and other pollinators are going to make good use of it. And then cannas. Oh, my goodness. Um, here we've got the classic red cannas, but uh, a heavy nectar producer. I was down at one of those really fancy gardens down in Georgia years ago, and they had this huge circle bed kind of mounted up and it was full of cannas. And I thought I was going to get impaled by hummingbirds flying back and forth from the trees to these things. Uh, they were just hitting it like crazy. So if you like cannas, put some more out. They're really going to get used by the hummingbirds. Some basics, you know, think of just your basic landscaping principle. Masses are going to look better and are more likely to attract hummingbirds. When it comes to planting flowers and especially for, for wildlife or hummingbirds, don't go with a single specimen, you know, plant a lot of things together. You want a lot of mass. Pay attention to the, you know, right plant in the right place, sun, shade, wind. So we sometimes make, we have the right plant in the wrong location. So we're just very, very frustrated with it. So understand you're all master gardeners. You understand the importance of, of looking at your location and, you know, where's the sunny spot? Where's the hot spot? Where's the shady spot? What plants can we put there? One of my favorites is I always tell people, overcare the annuals, undercare the perennials. Three-fourths of the perennials are just weeds that we found a use for. So they sometimes do better with neglect. Uh, annuals, annuals are going to try like heck to make a seed. So you want to keep clipping those, those you know, deadheading, basically. Get those spent blossoms off. Keep them well fertilized. Keep them, you know, sending up new flower buds because it's the flowers that we want to have there to attract the hummingbirds. Got to talk about Orioles for just a couple of slides here. Orioles are nectar feeders also. They're a, they're a tropical bird. They come up every year from, from Central America, from South America. They will come and feed at your hummingbird feeders. You can buy, you know, in the bottom picture here, this is a Oriole feeder, which is just a, a hummingbird feeder on steroids, basically. The same four to one ratio that you can make sugar water for the Hummingbirds is the same thing you use for, for Orioles. Uh, it, it cracks me up that all of the Oriole feeders are always painted orange. I don't know if that makes a difference or not. Uh, feeding jelly is a popular thing. And I know people that go through cases of jelly every year feeding their Orioles. A lot of debate about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I find I get Orioles at, at my jelly feeders and my oranges for about a month in the spring and then they get busy raising the kids and they're out getting caterpillars and, and, and I don't see them anymore at the feeders. Occasionally they'll show back up at my hummingbird feeders, but oranges cut in half, very effective. People sometimes say, well, can I use other jellies other than, than grape jelly? Had a friend that retired here, a naturalist a few years ago, did an experiment where she had about 15 different jams, jellies and marmalades and saucers on her deck. They ignored everything except the grape jelly. So something about the grape jelly they like. I don't know. But other, other jellies didn't do a thing for it. Most places where they're selling hummingbird feeders will also sell some of these um, Oriole feeders of different forms and like that. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm slowly going to be going more towards just putting out oranges. I go through about, well, probably 25 pounds of oranges during the late April and and in the month of May. Orioles are going to arrive a little bit later than hummingbirds. I say Orioles are going to start hitting the state around about 10 days later, about the 25th of, of April. Um, and they will hit my feeder, my oranges, my feeders hard in May uh, and a little bit in June. What will happen is we'll get these waves of migrants coming through the state. Um, and as I mentioned with the hummingbirds, We'll get a change in the weather. The south wind will become a north wind. It'll cool down and migration just stops. So all of a sudden for three days to 10 days, depending on how long that cold front stays in place, that north wind stays in place, you may have 15, 20 Orioles at your feeders. Then the, the clouds part, the wind shifts back to the south and all of a sudden you've got one or two. That's what's happened. They've just migrated on. Southbound migration, 
and I prefer that over fall because it's all happening in, in summer. Uh, southbound migrations a little bit earlier. They're going to start moving uh, around the latter part of August. By the end of September, most Orioles are gone. Whatever you put out for the Orioles, house finches may get on them. Mockingbirds, catbirds, thrashers, they all have a sweet tooth. Sometimes it's just fascinating to see all the different species that will come to the jelly, to the, to the oranges that you have out there. Okay, right now, here we are, first, you know, third of March. We, and yesterday was very, very cruel, you know, got all of our spring fever just really cranking up. Um, make sure feeders are clean and ready to be put up. Put at least one feeder up around the 15th of April. I, I, I'll be very honest, I've got seven to eight feeders that I have off my back patio. Like every old farmhouse, that's where we come and go all the time. I've got one feeder on the front and it kind of helps spread things around. Once you put that feeder up, you need to be changing the nectar every two to three days. If it's really cold, maybe four days. Keep, keep an eye on the nectar in there. When the nectar starts to get cloudy, it's time to change it. Um, if it's really hot and sunny, you may need to change that every day. One thing that I'm finally getting people convinced to do is not fill them all the way up. Because if you fill that, you know, a standard feeder is going to hold eight to 16 ounces of, of sugar water. If you fill that up every time starting April 15th, you're going to dump a lot of sugar water out. Hummingbirds don't care whether it's full or not as long as there is sugar water in there. Mix it up and put just, just enough in to, to feed them. And if you start seeing activity, you can start filling them fill, fuller. If they're draining it, add more the next time you put it in. This is going to be more of a situation, especially when we get into the, to the August time frame. You do not need red dye in the water at all. Um, a lot of research going on right now are the dyes harmful? The, the level of the dye in a lot of these prepackaged feeds is about 17 times higher than what the FDA has set as limits in human food. You don't need it. There is enough red on the feeder. All you need is enough red about the size of your little fingernail. That's all the more red you really need to get their attention. It doesn't take much at all. Um, so just make your own sugar water. It, it's just Four parts water, one part sugar. Sometimes I say that backwards, like I'm trying to make candy or something, but four parts water, one part sugar. And you don't have to boil it because the minute it goes into that feeder, it's going to be contaminated. Um, I will use hot or warm tap water simply because it makes the sugar go into solution easier. If you want to make a pint or a quart, then put however much you want in the feeder, put the rest of it in the refrigerator. That'll keep it good longer. Um, I tell people, unless you're going broke buying sugar, you can't have too many feeders. And then once again, you don't have to fill them completely full. The one thing that I'm very, oh, clean the feeder at each filling. You don't have to sterilize it. You don't have to scrub it in boiling water and chlorine. Uh, use a brush, clean it out good. Use hot water about every couple, three weeks, especially later on in the summer. I will bring them in, have a weak bleach solution and, and clean them up good because you'll sometimes get that mildew growing in there. So get that cleaned up. Uh, honey or artificial sweeteners? No, 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 no. Honey can do to hummingbirds just like it can to babies. It can make them very sick. Um, people go, well, they're, they're, you know, honey is just made from nectar that the bees gathered. Yeah, that's true, but it's at a lot higher concentration. Artificial sweeteners? No, they need the carbohydrates. I remember one year had this dear sweet lady call me up and want to know how much out of a sweet and low or just what she needed to use for her hummingbird feeder. I don't know if it was because she thought her hummingbird feeder was getting a little bit on the ch hummingbird was getting a little bit chunky or if that's all she had. But I finally got her convinced, no, go buy a small package of, of sugar. You can't use artificial sweeteners. They, I mean, using artificial sweeteners would be like the celery diet. You'd kill them from malnutrition. So don't do it. And actually, I don't even know if they drink out of that, but I'm not going to try. Um, interesting thing about hummingbird feeding, one eight ounce feeder is going to meet the daily energy needs of as many as 60 hummingbirds. If you've got eight ounce feeders that are being drained every day, you either have a lot more hummingbirds than you suspect coming to it, or like me, you've got a squirrel getting up there and dumping the feeder and getting as much as they can. So I think I finally got them fixed of that. Uh, more feeders, I mean, we've all seen the territoriality of these little rascals, especially young males. They will, you know, claim the feeders as their own. The more feeders you put up, 
you start to reach overload and they finally they'll just guard one and say the heck with it and all that um but more feeders will allow them to feed with less stress i thought it was going to be cute one year when i lived in town had a hummingbird feeder in back of the house and had this hummingbird that was just real territorial with it so i thought well i'll just put one on the front well, this little guy would go back and forth over the house all day long, trying to guard both of them. So I just gave up in that case. And again, avoid the dyed commercial mixes. Just buy sugar and make your own. Summary on this before we get into some problems around feeders. Um, hummingbird appropriate plant material will help. Multiple feeders will really attract them. And literally, I, I think you can bring hummingbirds almost anywhere, even to downtown Kansas City, if somebody would put up a hummingbird feeder. Get your feeders out by April 15th. Get ready around the 1st of August. Last week of July, first week of August. Get ready to really gear up. I will have just a couple hummingbird feeders out back um, when I start here in April. Uh, but as the year goes along, they just keep growing more and more and more of them. Then other times, the other thing is people will sometimes call and say, when do I need to take my feeders down so the hummingbirds need, know to migrate south? That has nothing to do with it. Hummingbirds are going to migrate. That's hardwired into them. You know, if we've got one that's missing that hardwiring, well, just keep them well fed until they die from some other cause. But um, you don't need to take it down. In fact, I encourage people to leave at least one hummingbird feeder up late into the season. Because usually if we get to the first of November and you've got a hummingbird coming to your feeder, it's probably not a ruby throat. And then us real serious bird watchers get really excited about figuring out what it was. Have a friend over in Manhattan that had a feeder up, didn't have anything in it, but had a feeder up. And the week before Thanksgiving last fall, all of a sudden this hummingbird started showing up. It was a broad-billed hummingbird. It was the fourth state record of broad-billed hummingbird. So leave it up. Okay, so when do you need to take the hummingbird feeder down? Well, if you get to this situation, yeah, it's probably time to get the hummingbird feeder down. Um, this was taken several years ago in Wichita. They had one of those Thanksgiving snowstorms and a friend's neighbor still had their hummingbird feeder out and sugar water will freeze. We have evidence of it right here. Okay, issues at the feeders. And I'm seeing some chats coming in. So I'm hopefully, hopefully we're gonna have a lot of questions here because I love the questions. Uh, answer the feeder are, are a lifelong problem. Um, we tried all sorts of things and finally we found these moats and it is simply a container that you can see at the top, you're hooked up here, and then this is filled with water. Don't need to put anything in it, just water. And unless you've got vegetation too close here where the ants can drop off, this is, I mean, this takes care of 99.99% .99 of my ant problems. And the neat thing is they've got these in different sizes. They've got them now, some that'll probably hold a pint or a quart. When these things first started coming out, they held one or two ounces of water. Well, Kansas in summer, that means we were filling them two or three times a day. Now they've got them where, I mean, you can fill them once every three or four days and they work great. Doesn't, you know, I've seen hummingbirds sit on the edge of these silly things, um, but I've taken care of 99.9% .9 of my ant problems. Any place that has hummingbird feeders should have these ant moats out there with them. Uh, no hummers at the feeder. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Bees are the other problem. Bees will use that sugar water. It is a cheap nectar source. Um, get rid of dripping feeders. If you've got a feeder that's dripping and you can see in a hurry, and sometimes it's just the wind. Wind will cause them to blow and you start getting this rocking action and they start draining out. Squirrels, well, we won't go there. Uh, yellow is to bees as red is to hummingbirds. It's that flashing neon light. If you ever look at, at the garden store, at the, at the, at the hornet traps, the, the wasp traps, the, the yellow jacket traps, they're always yellow for that reason. Um, slowly, the hummingbird feeder manufacturers are getting away from putting any decorative yellow on them. Uh, try to get it out of there. They're getting new inserts that'll go into a lot of those feeders that are just a little bit taller so the bees can't get their tongue down to the nectar. The hummingbirds have no problems. Got friends down in, in Pittsburgh that take those um, cocktail straws and, and cut them off so they stick up just about a quarter inch above where the feeder normally was keeps the bees away, the hummingbirds have no problem. So lots of ways to deal with that. Now, if you're also a beekeeper, you may never get away from the problem. If you've got bees robbing a hummingbird feeder and you take that hummingbird feeder down, do it at night, 
and then don't go back there during the next couple of days because the bees are going to be looking for it and they're not going to be happy. I used to keep bees. I know how they are. No hummers. Every year people will call me up and say, I've got no hummingbirds this year. Well, last year, I think they were all at my feeders because I had plenty of them. Um, and, and then at the same time, others report normal numbers. I think especially in larger urban areas, we're getting into what I call NFS, neighborhood feeder saturation. We're getting so many people putting out hummingbird feeders because it's fascinating to watch them that the amount of nectar available exceeds the biological needs of the hummingbirds that are there. Um, I made that phrase up. You can call it whatever you want to. Um, what it does do is it spreads the hummingbirds out. Um, less competition equals less stress. So I think that's part of the problem. I think we also just see normal cycles of birds. These are neotropical migrants. They winter in southern Mexico, northern Central America. Uh, you get to Panama, you're probably fasting. I was on a bird watching trip down there 10 years ago, and we were up on the, you know, right next to, to Costa Rica, and we saw a female, humming, female ruby throated hummingbird. And our guide was so excited because he'd never seen a ruby throated hummingbird in Panama before. So, you know, that's where they're going to be. Some of those hummingbirds will launch off of the Yucatan Peninsula and fly nonstop across the Gulf of Mexico to the Texas coast. If they hit a storm along the way, they may never make it. So, I mean, things can happen in, in the wintering areas that cause them to, to not survive. Um, they may just have reached their, their limit. They may not have had a nest last year. They died during the winter from old age. In a year or two, things normally cycle back around. We feel that hummingbird, especially ruby throat hummingbird numbers are are steady to increasing based on breeding bird survey activity. Um, it's just, it's, I don't think there's anything drastically wrong happening, just normal cycles of nature. Couple of myths, I've always got to dispel these right now. Hummingbirds do not migrate on the backs of other birds. I've heard that they migrate on the backs of Canada geese. No self-respecting hummingbird would even think of doing that. Um, and if you think about the timing of it, geese are migrating north in March, they're already starting to move. Hummingbirds don't get here until a month and a half later. And southbound migration, geese, by the time the geese get here, most of the hummingbirds have already moved out. So it's just, no, they just have their own leisurely pace. They're not gonna migrate on the back of some other bird. They are powerful flyers. Uh, finch feeders should not be near hummingbird feeders as the finches will kill the hummingbirds. The only problem that I have had with finch feeders near hummingbird feeders, and I've got them about 18 inches apart, is that the finches land on top of the hummingbird feeder and then I have to clean all their whitewash off of that. So um, no, hummingbirds can outfly just about anything. Because of their flight capability, predation is not much of a threat. We have documented this whole list, cats, small raptors, hawks, shrikes, Baltimore Orioles, Eastern Kingbirds, the large non-native praying mantises um, will capture them. You've seen the pictures on social media, that is real. The native praying mantises that are only that long aren't a problem. But dragonflies, frogs, they get caught in large spider webs. Just cats, I will say it once, I, I love cats. I had a cat for many, many years. Cats are not native to the North American ecosystem and should not be outside. They kill a billion birds a year in the U.S. and Canada. We just need to get them out of the outside. They're going to live longer on the inside. Accidents, there's things like um, burdock that has this nice red flower. And then right next to it is the seed pod that's developing. That's like a giant overgrown cocklebur. Um, so, so plants with hooks and spines on will sometimes get them. Window collisions, cars, radio towers. You did the same, same list that we see with a lot of bird species. We'll get hummingbirds as well. One of the challenges quite honestly is because of their small size, it's hard to find mortalities. They, they run into the window, they drop down they're gone by the next day. Something probably scavenges on them. So that happens. Um, if you want more information, Hummingbirds of North America by Sherry Williamson is absolute the Bible of, of hummingbirds for, the, for North America and north of Mexico. Um, Sherry lives down in Bisbee, Arizona. That is Hummingbird Central. Uh, this, just a picture of my copy. You can see it is well-worn from answering questions and just reading up on them. Uh, the other thing that I say is it's all about having fun. If, if you're ha getting frustrated feeding, just feeding birds of any kind, 
you know, you need to maybe take a step back, give me a call. I'll talk you down off the ledge and we'll, we'll go from there. But it's, it's just, you don't have to identify the hummingbirds come into your feeder. If you just enjoy watching them, that's what really matters. Um, there's some additional interests here. I'll leave this up for a little bit. Uh, ksbirds.org is a website that I maintain for the Kansas Ornithological Society. Has a lot of information about birds in general. Uh, those next three, hummingbirdcentral.com, hummingbirds.net, and hummingbirdsociety.org are all three excellent. I mean, I just checked these um, sites to make sure they were still active. Um, they're, they're all good, all good sites. All have a lot of good information on quite a few of them. They, they keep a up-to-date map of how far the birds have migrated. So that can be a good one. This, this long, nasty one here at the bottom, uh, that's an, an old extension, uh, an old website that I have for our extension office. I've got a series of eight backyard birding guides that are there. They're PDFs. You can download them, print them off. Might be of help to you. And we'll close out with just some, some more uh, hummingbirds from Panama called white-necked Jacobins. Uh, you can see where they got their name there. Uh, this was part of the, of the trip we took to Panama bird watching, and we were at a nature lodge, and they just had these big, wide terraces on this balcony with these feeders just sitting there, and the hummingbirds just ignored you and came and went all day. Um, I'll just throw that up there for a second. That's who I am. That's how you can get a hold of me. That CAUDI at ksu.edu is probably the best way to get a hold of me. I will be retiring later this year. So after 40 years now, I should have updated my bio before Lynn read it. Um, then this 238416 one, they'll just give you my home number. So that's fine. But let's go ahead and open it up to, um, to questions. So I'll just leave this up for another second. But Lynn, if you want to start reading back the questions, um, okay. I'll start trying to answer them. How far apart should feeders be to stop them from fighting? Um, I... <laughs> If they're within, I mean, like I said, I put them on either side of a house and they still had fighting, uh, just put up more feeders. Just put up more feeders. I've got my feeders about 24 inches apart just because I didn't want to be running into them while I was cleaning them out. Um, I see people that have them literally one every foot on their on their deck. Uh, the territoriality of it, you just try to overload them so they just give up on that. What about the flat honeycomb type of feeder? Flat honeycomb type of feeder? I don't have any personal experience with that. Um, I, I think it would require you to probably change the nectar more frequently. That might be a good question that'll trigger me to go buy one this year because I always need excuses to buy more bird gear um, and see how it works. But yeah, it's I, I really don't have any practical experience. Next question, best location for their feeders? Best location for their feeders, excellent question. I like to put them where I can watch them. I seem to find that feeders that are put in heavy shade don't seem to get as much activity. Um, I say that, but then I've got one out underneath the front porch where it's very seldom, but it's right next to bright sunlit. I mean, I get a lot of activity at that, but the ones that I have out back in conjunction with a lot more um, landscaping and, and that are in full sun, I, it's just hummingbird central there. So put them where you can see them, the more sun, the better. Okay. What is your favorite shape of feeder? I have a bowl-shaped feeder that seems to evaporate quickly. I'll be, I mean, I, I use the basic feeder and you saw the top of one. I guess I should have had one out there that, so you can see the whole thing. I don't think if it's, na it's from Nature Brand or, or Perky Pet or something, but basically just a tube that's got the disc on the bottom with eight or so feeding holes that you can spin on and off easily to fill it. Um, I, I can't remember the name of it right now, but the simpler, the better. I just, I literally go to, you know, one of the like Orishlands tractor supply. If you've got a, a wild bird store nearby, uh, go and look there. And, and sometimes the cheaper ones are the, are the best ones to have. I go through a lot of hummingbird feeders. I occasionally have troubles with raccoons ready my hummingbird feeders. So um, I, I like these because they're about 10 bucks a piece. They're, they're interchangeable. I don't have to worry about it. You can get different size tops to put on them to have more nectar available. So um, the, the, the traditional, what I call traditional one, which is the, the tube, the, the jar on top with uh, the round, flat, red disc, um, I, is what I've had the best luck with. Um, that's all the questions. And most of the comments I won't read. But this last one, I will. I use Journey North 
to track and figure out when to put out my feeders, HTTPS maps journey north, uh, org. Is that something you recommend? Oh yeah, journeys north, and I don't know why I don't have that one on there. is is an excellent website. They do a lot of really neat things. Um, yeah, journeys north is a great website, and and even eBird. If you happen to use eBird to track your sightings, eBird.org. Um, you can go on there and you can see current year maps to see how far north they're going. Um, that's a good way to, to track it too. I don't worry too much about that. I just figured by the 15th of April, I better have my hummingbird feeder out because it won't be long before they're there. Uh, if you're on the Kansas Birding Facebook page or on ksbirds-l, which is a inter email listserv, um, people in the southern part of the state will usually have their report saying, oh, have my first hummingbird feeder. So everybody north of that knows, okay, time to put them up. <laughs>